allow me to start my presentation with a citation which explains my motivation to write this book. And it is uh, from Graham Furness, <coughs> his book, Poetry, Prose, and Popular Culture in Hausa. He said that a debate is taking place about post-colonial literature and society in Africa in which writing in English or French is pursued without any acknowledgement that a world, a whole world of debate has been going on vigorously and at length in African languages. Now, the question is Arabic and African language. And I would argue, yes, the majority, overwhelming majority of Arabs live in which continent? Yes, in Africa. And, uh, you know, it's the language uh, by far, the African language most spoken or used by the people. You know, maybe 250 million Arab, 250 million Muslim, that is 500,000. And uh, spoken by more people than, 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 than Kiswahili, which is the second with uh, only about, you know, 100 million uh, speakers. So what Furnish says, there is no better illustration of this than two books that deeply influence the intellectual debate uh, about the production of knowledge in Africa and on Africa. <coughs> so these books were so uh, influential that their authors received respectively uh, the Melville Herskovitz Prize from the African Studies Association of North America which is awarded annually to the best book on Africa written in English. So both books, both authors, I'm sorry, come from a Christian background. They had attended top Western universities. They taught in prestigious uh, American universities, and they represented two dominant intellectual traditions in post-colonial Africa, which is Anglophone and Francophone. But what was more striking as a common denominator between the two authors, which they share with African intellectuals trained in Western languages was their very Eurocentric approach to the production of knowledge in Africa and on Africa. Mudimbe, for example, argues that <coughs> the writings having contributed to the invention and the idea of Africa were for the most part produced by, European, by Europeans during the colonial period, and they formed what uh, he called the colonial library and that the European interpreters, like the African analysts, used categories and conceptual systems that stemmed from the Western epistemological order. <clears throat> so for Apia, he stated that most writings produced in Sub-Saharan Africa were in Portuguese, French, and English, and that consequently, most intellectuals of Sub-Saharan Africa was what he called Europhone. In other words, they wrote in European languages. Now, what is this book about? To summarize it in one sentence, it's about the literary cultures of West Africa. Why the title Beyond Timbuktu? Because the old West African city of Timbuktu, which is famous as a great center of Muslim learning from Islam's golden age, renowned for its madrasa and archives of rare Arabic manuscripts, is not unique. It was uh, one among many scholarly centers to exist in pre-colonial West Africa before the rise of Western imperial and intellectual hegemony in the region. Now, in Freetown, Sierra Leone, the Church Missionary Society created the Fura Bay College in 1827 as the first college to offer instruction in a European language in West Africa. At that time, several Islamic centers of higher learning already existed in West Africa, and one of the oldest is Sankore, which had been in Timbuktu for, uh, which has been in Timbuktu since the 14th century, and Sankore compared favorably with the best centers of Islamic learning in the Muslim world in the 16th century. It attracted students and scholars from West Africa, from the Maghreb, and beyond. And the rise of spiritual and intellectual centers such as Sankore rested largely on the economic prosperity of this region, the Niger uh, Bend region. Now, though Mali is today one of the poorest economies or poorest countries on earth, the predecessor empire whose name it adopted was a global sub supplier of gold. When Sankore was established two centuries after the creation of Timbuktu, an estimated two-thirds 
of the world's gold came from West Africa, a large part of which passed through Timbuktu. And I, I hasten to add that historians are unsure of exactly how much gold was exported from Sub-Saharan Africa to the north. According to the best estimates, it was slightly above one ton a year between the 9th and the 15th centuries. Although this may look insignificant compared with the amount of gold produced with the support of modern extracting technologies, medieval mining techniques limited the quantity of gold that could be obtained anywhere in the world and limited geographical knowledge kept the gold of the new world outside global markets. By the 10th century, West African gold was being minted into coins in the cities of the Maghrib before circulating widely in the rest of Africa and, and, and throughout Asia. The gold was the main attraction for the Arabs to this region, the Bilad the Sudan, land of the black. And the huge quantities of gold exported by the Western Bilad the Sudan, by West Africa, attracted the interest of uh, Arab and Western geographers. Between the 9th and the 17th century, no fewer than 75 trade routes were, produ uh, were produced by Arab geographers. They gave detailed information on the exact position of trading centers and oases and the length of caravan routes and days of traveling time between centers. And in the year 1324, Mali's emperor, Mansa Musa, stayed three days in Egypt on his way to Mecca, and he distributed so much gold that his passage was recorded in great details by Egyptians and even Europeans. Indeed, a picture of Mansa Musa is featured in the Catalan Atlas of 1375, drawn by Abraham Crest, which is one of the first map, maps to provide reliable information about Africa. You could see it here, and the picture of Mansa Musa here in the map of Abraham Crest. So on his return to West Africa from the pilgrimage, uh, Mansa Musa brought with him many books and even scholars. And the emergence of the Portuguese as a naval power and the discovery of gold in the Americas somewhat shifted the center of gravity of regional trade and led to a reduction in Timbuktu's prominence over the course of the 16th century. But Timbuktu remained an important regional uh, commercial and intellectual hub until the Sardian uh, invasion or the Moroccan invasion which precipitated the decline of Songhai. It was in 1591. The Moroccan expeditionary force was composed of Spanish, Arab, and Berber soldiers called Arma from the Arabic word Rumat or musketeers. Subsequently, the Arma settled in the region, declared their independence from the Sardian monarchy, and intermarried with the local elites. The 1591 expedition precipitated the collapse of the last and most prosperous and powerful medieval West African state, undermining its economic prosperity, which supported a vibrant intellectual life. This, in turn, led to the decline of intellectual centers that had flourished in West Africa prior to the invasion, uh, including Timbuktu in the 16th century. And if you look at the map of West Africa now, 15 of the 16 states have, have their capitals in the coast. And these uh, capitals you know, used to be the trading centers uh, created by the Euro Europeans which means that what the arrival of the Europeans did was to move the economic center of gravity from the hinterland to the coast. You know. Fifteen of the capitals of West Africa now you know, used to be the trading posts where the Europeans uh, 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 stayed. You know. Whereas before the invasion, uh, it was cities of the hinterland like Timbuktu, Gao, Jene, which were really main important uh, intellectual and commercial centers. <coughs> now, Although the Arma expeditionary force quickly declared its independence from the Sardian dynasty, relations between Muslims in North and West Africa survived Arma secession and indeed persist in the 21st century. Throughout the second millennium, black African Berbers and Arabs maintained close contact, as shown by the Moroccan invasion and the no less infamous Oriental slave trade, their relations at time have been violent, but as shown by the Islamic scholarly tradition that this book analyzed, they have also been mutually beneficial through intermarriage, through trade, through diplomacy, uh, 
and above all uh, spiritual and intellectual exchanges yet those exchanges so far have been the least studied aspect of uh, North African sub-Saharan relations due to the ways the Western Academy has invented and studied Africa. Western universities nowadays typically divide the academic study of Africa so that North Africa, Morocco, Libya, Tunisia, uh, Algeria and Egypt fall within the realm of Middle Eastern studies whereas the area south of the Sahara considered Africa proper is studied within the field of uh, African studies. So such a division and its underlying assumptions overlook the fact that the Arabic language as a language of Islamic learning and liturgy was the glue uh, holding together large populations of the Maghreb, the Sahara and Sub-Saharan Africa. And Arabic as a linguistic vehicle of knowledge transmission was as important in the history of the Muslim peoples in Africa and elsewhere as Latin was in Europe. And uh, I cannot resist the temptation to tell you an anecdote when I was appointed to the Al Walid chair in, uh, uh, at Harvard to teach uh, you know, Islamic intellectual history in Africa. And the librarian of the Divinity School, where I taught, contacted me and said, if you need books, let us know, and we will arrange those books for you. And uh, I uh, wanted to order books written by African scholars from West Africa in Arabic. He said that he doesn't have that expertise and that he only has expertise in Christianity. And he directed me to the librarian of Middle Eastern Studies. I want to see him requesting that he orders the books for me and he told me that he doesn't do sub-Saharan Africa, he does just North Africa, but directed me to the librarian of African studies. I spoke to the librarian of African studies who told me that she does not order books, uh, you know, in Arabic because it is not an African language. So I couldn't order books to teach a course, although my position was established in order to promote the field of uh, uh, African intellectualism. Thankfully, the dean, you know, used his discretionary funds to allow me to order the books. But just to tell you that when I was appointed, that was there, there was that problem of division of labor, center of Middle Eastern studies, center of African studies, librarian of Middle Eastern studies, librarian of African studies. Now, uh, what about this uh, intellectual tradition in Africa, which is expressed in Arabic that I am analyzing in this book? So, where would you get the books in order to 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 uh, to teach them. Anyway, so this is just an anecdote. And uh, so to, ch to tell you that the main point that during the second millennium, the Arabic language played a, trans a transformative role in West African history. Some Islamized people in the Sahara gradually deserted their linguistic, cultural, and, uh, their, and ethnic identities to claim exclusive Arab identities. Some Islamized people in the Sahara gradually deserted their linguistic, cultural, and ethnic identities to claim exclusive Arab identities. Others have retained their African languages but have used the Arabic script to transcribe them, to compose scholarly treaties, to chronicle history, and to write poetry. And there is attested usage of uh, the Arabic script in 80 African languages. And... Uh, in West Africa alone, we find, you know, uh, Arabic literature in uh, 29 languages. So this is the most, uh, the most uh, uh, recent research about these languages. According to historian of Timbuktu, Hamu al-Arawani, a Sudani, uh, converts to Islam might have started to transcribe their language with the Arabic script as early as the 12th century when they began to, to preach their religion among their people. The use might have been very limited, however, there is consensus that, that its more widespread use began in the 18th century, which coincides with the formation of a critical mass of Muslim scholars. Among them, those intellectual originating from the countryside led movements of religious uh, and political reform and captured political power in various regions of West Africa and established Islamic states in the 18th century and virtually half of West Africa was under Islamic rule in the mid-19th century. Non-Arabs, as we know, wrote much of what has been written in Arabic in the Arabic language in the formative period of Islamic civilization from the 8th to the 15th century. As more people converted 
uh, to Islam in subsequent century, Arabic became a language of learning for even more people, including in West Africa. And Arabic and Arjami uh, were a major or the major medium of instruction for Muslims into the rise of Western uh, hegemony. By the 18th century, several scholarly communities, you know, writing in Arabic or Arjami flourished in West Africa. We know this not just from the Arabic sources, but also from the testimonies of European travelers. The governor of, uh, the French governor of Senegal, uh, Baron Roger, wrote that they were in Senegal more Negroes uh, who could read and write in Arabic in 1828 than French peasants who could read and write French. Francis Moore, an employee of the uh, Royal African Company of England, a chartered company established in England and active in Senegambia wrote in his travel narratives that in every kingdom and country of the river Gambia, <coughs> Pular speaking communities spoke Arabic and that they were generally more learned in the Arabic than the people of Europe are in Latin, for they can most of them speak it, though they have a vulgar tongue besides called folly. Several other explorers before and after Moore including Ibn Battuta, and I will comment on him in the 14th century, Leo Africanus in the 15th century, the European explorer Mungo Par in the 18th century, and others uh, in the 19th century testified to Islamic erudition in West Africa long before the colonial scramble of the late 19th century. And the French explorer René Cayet, who visited Timbuktu in the early 19th century, stated that all the Negroes of Timbuktu are able to read the Quran and even know it by heart. Now, what is the content of this archive? According to John Henwick, or Henwick suggested that Islamic writings in Africa fall broadly into four categories. Historical uh, writings, pedagogical writings, devotional writings, and polemical writings. And I will add a fifth category, which I describe as political writings, for lack of a better term. And these five overlapping genres form the bulk of the Islamic library in West Africa. In the main, they are written in Arabic, but among the political writings, in particular, a portion was written in Ajami. Uh, now, <coughs> the first category is that of historical writings, which includes, in addition to chronicles that provide much of our knowledge of the pre-colonial West African states, a number of documents describing the customs of the people uh, and as well as uh, ijazad or authorization to transmit knowledge or, 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 or fatawa. Here you see the two famous uh, Timbuktu chronicles, Tarikh al-Fatash and Tarikh al-Sudan, which had been used for the reconstruction of political uh, history of West Africa, especially the succession of the three major um, empires, medieval empires, Ghana, Mali, and Songa. So the second category is made up of pedagogical writings. Although Islamic texts produced outside West Africa have been circulating in the region for centuries, Sudanese <coughs> Sheikh or people from the, the Bilad of Sudan, Shu from the Bilad of Sudan, they produced their own commentary and textbooks. They often wrote testified commentaries of classical texts to make them easier for their students to learn. This is true for, <coughs> this is true of the great intellectual centers in present day Senegal and Mali, as well as those of remote regions where Muslim communities uh, were isolated from the major uh, trade networks and where copies of books were difficult to uh, obtain. <coughs> the third category, devotional writings. They are found in most collections of West African Islamic manuscript. They consist essentially of poetry written in Arabic, but also in African languages, such as Fulfulde, Hausa, and Wolof. And most Sufi scholars wrote poems, of, poems or collections of poems in praise of the Prophet Muhammad. And these poems are often recited uh, during uh, Sufi rituals and festivals.
Now, the fourth category, polemical writings. These were produced abundantly from the beginning of the 19th century when it was mainly a future of the rivalry, the rivalry between the Qadiriya and the Tijaniya Sufi order. Starting in the second half of the 20th century, as the Wahhabi impact on West Africa increased, polemical writings consisted mainly of attacks on and defense of Sufism. And in the late 20th century, from Senegal to Kenya, there was no African uh, country with a Muslim population that had been left untouched by the polemics in regard uh, to Sufism and its opponent. And here I am just giving you an example of a text written by Umar Tal, who was a major uh, fi a figure of uh, Islam in West Africa, a towering figure of the 19th century, and who uh, established a state following a jihad, you know, which uh, uh, was the, the, the largest in the region, never before, never again was uh, such a huge state uh, submitted to an Islamic authority in the Sahel. And, in, and, and he wrote this book, uh, Bayan Mawaka, which was a polemics between him and the leader of Masina before uh, uh, conquering Mas Masina. So the last and final category is that of political writings. It was particularly true for the Fodiawa or the community of Usman Dan Fojo, which found it, you see the map here, the Sokoto Caliphate, which was also a large uh, polity in the central Sudan. So, and this is the Kitab al-Farq uh, uh, of uh, Usman Dan Fojo, which he wrote and uh, in which they criticized the ha uh, Hausa kingdoms before waging the jihad against them and, and, and toppling them. Now, Post-jihad reformers, after bringing down the uh, pre-jihad uh, pre Hausa kingdom, they restored the very system against which they had fought. And this led to the production of writings by opponents who condemned them. Why? Because drastic political change, such as that witnessed in Hausa land under the leadership of Sheikh Usman Dan Fodu, could come only with huge sacrifice, sacrifices and with with huge expectations, and whenever the leadership failed to meet these expectations, the instruments used to overthrow the status quo ante will be effectively uh, exploited to, sub to subvert the new order. And in chapter five of the book, I draw from this archive of writings to analyze the ways in which, in the pre-colonial period, Muslim scholars endeavored to shape an Islamic space of meaning in West Africa, and they, uh, to try to define the political community, delimit its boundary. They also strove to record the social and intellectual history of the Muslim community for future generations. And these two concerns, I argue, uh, have been central in the endeavor of Muslim intellectuals in the period from the 17th to the uh, early 20th century. Timbuktu was conquered by the French three centuries after the Moroccan invasion of 1591. European colonial rule paved the way for the spread of modern colleges in West Africa, such as uh, Fura Bay College, which I mentioned previously, established by the church missionary societies at the beginning of the 19th century. Now, Fura Bay College was one such island of Western higher education uh, in an ocean of Arabic-speaking colleges in West Africa. That was in the 19th century. But in the late 20th century, the impact of European, in the, uh, the impact of European colonialism had reversed this, and French, English, and Portuguese had become the official languages of schooling and administration in the whole of West Africa. Of the hundreds of modern colleges and universities created in West Africa at the beginning of the second de decade of the 21st century, less than 5% offer instruction in Arabic, and the oldest of them is the University Islamic Desai, which was inaugurated in Niger in 1987. Between the building of the Sankore Mosque in the 14th century and the inauguration of the University Islamic Desai in 1987, higher Islamic education waxed and waned in West Africa, but the Arabic language itself has remained central to the social and intellectual life of Muslim communities. Arabic has become the language in which more than 250 million people south of the Sahara say their, their daily prayers. And 
and these represent 15% of the global Muslim population. They share this language and many aspects of Islamic culture with North, North Africa. However, as a language of administration and scholarly production, Arabic has been displaced by the rise to prominence of intellectual educated in European languages. And as I said, philosopher Kwame, Nkuma, uh, Kwame Apia called these Europhone intellectuals in the sense that through education and in the colonial language, through education in the colonial language, colonialism produced the intellectual ingredients uh, through which colonial subjects educated in European languages understood their own universe. In 1912, French scholar and colonial administrator Maurice de la Fosse produced a magisterial work on the French colony of Upper Senegal and Niger that had been created in 1904. De La Fosse's book provided a detailed historical ethnography of the people, cultures, and religions of what would become a central part of Francophone Africa. Following the steps of De La Fosse, colonial scholars in, cha in charge of Muslim affairs wrote abundantly about Muslim communities. The most prolific of them was Paul Marty, director of the Office of Muslim Affairs, who authored six studies on Islam and Muslims totaling thousands of pages. Colonial writings produce analytical categories to make sense of the social organization of the people. Borrowing from French social theorist Michel Foucault, Congolese philosopher Valentin Mudimbe, which I mentioned earlier, called this documentary field the colonial library. The colonial library, that is a body of writings by colonial scholars that create that creates a system of representation of African sites. The colonial library produce an intellectual framework to make sense of Africa and that framework inform writings in European uh, languages. So, according to Mudimbe, this library operate in the same uh, Western epistemological order. Yet, I will argue, Mudimbe tells only part of the complex story of higher learning in West Africa. Throughout the post-colonial period, debate on the production of knowledge in and about Africa in English and French were conducted with little mention of Sankore, with little mention of this Islamic scholarly tradition. As I show in this book, the breadth and depth of this intellectual tradition and its vitality and versatility are still some of which uh, few European intellectuals, both Africans and Western, are aware. The history of African literacy did not begin with the colonial encounter, uh, I argue that a discussion of the African library or intellectual history does little justice to the vibrant intellectual life between the formation of Sankore and the creation of Fura Bay College if it begins with the colonial period. The dominant epistemological uh, framework uh, for this period could not have been Western. Now, to fully appreciate the African library in the long durée, I will turn the discussion, its discussion, the discussion of African library on its head and start with Sankore as a paradigm for knowledge production and transmission. And then I will address uh, how much later, uh, uh, how uh, only much later the rise of Western colonial hegemony displaced this paradigm and placed Europhone intellectuals at the center of West African public life. Now let me... Uh, address the pre-colonial paradigm of knowledge transmission. Islamic, in, Islamic education in West Africa started at the beginning of Islamization during the first millennium. Among the, eye, among the eyewitness accounts of this scholarly tradition in medieval Mali, uh, notable is the globe torture Ibn Battuta, who I'm sure you all know about, and who wrote the following uh, about the people uh, of Mali, you know, a century after the creation of Sankore. So, just want to emphasize the fact that he was the first uh, uh, of the Arab scholars to go actually and visit, who was the first eye eyewitness. Many others wrote about the Bilad Sudan, but, you know, from information that they received from merchants, but uh, Ibn Battuta was the first eyewitness. He said about the people of Mali that they are very zealous in their attempts uh, to learn the Holy Quran by heart, in the event that their children are negligent in this respect, fetters are placed on the children's feet, feet and 
are left until the children can recite the Quran from memory. On a holiday, I went to see the judge and seeing his children in chain, I asked him, aren't you going to let him go? He answered, I won't let them go until they know the Quran by heart. Now, an important element of uh, classical epistemology that transpired from, its, uh, from this testimony is the centrality of the memorization of the Quran, if necessary, uh, through harsh uh, pun punishment inflicted on the body. Memorization was valued in the classical period of Islamic scholarship. Islamic studies in West Africa started at the Quranic school where pupils uh, as young as four were admitted and taught to memorize the Quran and write in the Arabic script. But unlike the widely disseminated cliché that, stereo that stereotypes this as mere road memorization, such education entailed far more than that. Rudolf Ware's seminal work uh, entitled The Working Quran shows that in it entailed the process of personal transformation based on the living example of the Quranic teacher. The imitation of the teacher's gestures and comportment was as much part of the educative process as the text one was required to read. That's what uh, um, Ware argues persuasively. Successful completion of Quranic studies paved the way to what we can call high Islamic studies in which advanced uh, students were taught a wide variety of subjects. Unlike beginners who learn mostly by memorization, higher Islamic studies students developed the linguistic proficiency required to understand the Quran and other religious texts and to speak Arabic. But at this stage of higher education too, memorization remained important in the pedagogy of Islamic studies. This was not due to the rarity of books and the relatively high cost of paper, but rather to the fact that committing a text to memory was a mark of scholarly distinction. Ibn Battuta's testimony validates the notion that harsh physical punishment was an element of Islamic schooling pedagogy. The goal of religious education was to create a virtuous Muslim subject. Achieving such a noble goal for Muslims justifies in inflicting physical pain on others or on the self. When speakers of Wolof, uh, uh, predominant language in, in Senegambia, uh, predominant language in Senegambia, describe a person as a working Quran, and they mean that he was transformed through education to become a virtuous Muslim, someone who throughout uh, his life follows the teaching of the Quran and refrains from his prohibition. And this idea of working Quran comes from a hadith uh, attributed to Aisha. Now, Michel Foucault, Talal Assad, and others note that the cultivation of technologies of the self were known in ancient societies, including in ancient Greece and during early and medieval Christianity. And Foucault argued that those technologies permit individuals to effect by their own means or with the help of others a certain number of operations on their own bodies and souls thoughts, conduct, and way of being so as to transform themselves in order to attain a certain state of happiness, purity, wisdom, perfection, or immortality. Uh, end of the quote. And this rigorous tradition of education was never abandoned in West Africa. The majority of Muslim families continue to invest in Islamic education for their children, even if they also attend uh, schools offering education in Western languages. This is because schooling is not just about receiving instruction. It was not just about receiving instruction, but about receiving a more holistic education under the supervision of a master. And such uh, close master-disciple relations were an important element of Sankore pedagogy and, uh, and epistemology. Now, Sankore was a place of worship and learning in which highly knowledgeable scholars engage in sophisticated intellectual conversations. But Sankore, or for that matter, uh, other Islamic institutions of high learning in North Africa and elsewhere did not operate like the universities we tend to call to mind. And George MacDiss's comparative study of medieval higher education in Islam and the West highlighted parallels in the methods of instructions and posts, but also differences. 
and let me just emphasize some of those differences. There was no single unified curriculum in the Sahel region and in the city of Timbuktu in particular. So, unlike in modern universities, they were, there was no central administration, no recruitment or graduation exam, and no school degree. University libraries as we know them now did not exist. Teachers, however, were very learned scholars. Some of them had studied in Egypt or elsewhere in West Africa uh, with the highest intellectual authorities of their time. Many Timbuktu scholars possessed personal libraries of hundreds or thousands of books. Scholars offered instruction inside mosques such as Sankore, but most scholars imparted knowledge to students in a special room in their home, which also housed their books and mastered Masters delivered authorization to teach specific texts to their students. The prestige of the authorization depended on the pedigree of the scholar. Pursuing higher education consisted uh, of studying with a sheikh either in his own mosque, in his house, in a zawiya, or in a public space. In major centers such as Timbuktu, students found instructors who could teach them most subjects, but most students did not live in such centers for them Peripatetic scholarship was the rule. Quranic education and initiation into the basic text might have been available in many rural and urban centers in the Sahel, but study of advanced texts required most students to travel tens, if not hundreds of thousands of miles to the village of a sheikh uh, with expertise on a specific subject or book. And unlike in modern times, when anybody can seek knowledge by ordering a book from Amazon.com or another bookseller, and studying it alone, only a scholar who received certification or permission was allowed to teach a text. And this is a fundamental difference between pre-colonial uh, Islamic epistemology and that of uh, Western modern school. In addition to lectures addressed to uh, sizable student groups, a system of mentorship linked masters to a smaller number of promising students to whom they imparted knowledge on an individual basis Members of inner circles of established scholars also served as assistants or secretaries, and through this system of intellectual patron-client relationship known as mulazama, students not only studied important books from a master, but they also had access to prestigious authorization to transmit knowledge. In addition, they learned from their masters other forms of knowledge not available in books such as mystic secrets on how to acquire wealth, influence, or greater piety. And the most zealous teaching assistants were likely to obtain the relevant credentials that ensured their gradual acceptance into the ranks of respected scholars. The search for knowledge was linked to the struggle for self-improvement. Unlike in modern colleges, where there was no fixed time frame for studying a text or a particular subject, Unlike in modern colleges, there was no fixed time frame for studying a text or a particular subject. Students could study for many, many years and often had to use, and often had to read, I'm sorry, and listen to a commentary of a major text several times. Students were taught the virtue of humility. Typically, the master alone would sit in a chair surrounded by students who sat on the floor and listened. This tradition is still maintained today in many theological schools of West Africa. Students showed their devotion to the master through physical work, but also by writing poems in praise of him. And indeed, in the surviving Arabic literature of West Africa, the most common genre is devotional literature in praise of the Prophet Muhammad, like the poem that I just, uh, you know, um, that we just uh, listened to a sheikh or a teacher, and these works may consist of writing an original poem or expanding and commenting on an original poem by adding more verses of a similar matter. In modern colleges of West Africa, a teacher provides instruction and may continue to serve as a mentor even after the student graduates. He may write reference letters in support of a student application, but he is not believed to have supernatural powers to influence the course of things in medieval center of learnings, in contrast, the teacher taught uh, the Quran, rules of grammar, and other subjects, but he did more than that. Uh, 
he played a central role in most life cycle events, whether it is birth, death, illness, employment, harvest, travel, the teacher intervened before and after to pray that his following, his following or disciples might succeed and be safe uh, from uh, reversal of uh, fortune. And he uh, is able to do that because he was uh, believed to be a friend of God. And, uh, but some were born as Wali, but others also could reach that high spiritual uh, status through learning and piety, performing spiritual exercise, combining uh, retreat from the world, khalwa, repeated recitation of one of the beautiful names of God, dhikr, fasting and nightly vigils were efficient ways to be promoted to a higher uh, spiritual rank. This level of uh, spiritual dynamic, dynamics found, uh, is, is found mostly within the uh, Sufi orders and before the 20th century, most of the scholars were initiated into Sufism and they transmitted weird of the Sufi orders. And the contribution of the Sufi orders, especially the Qadiriya and the Tijaniya, to uh, Islamic scholarship in Africa, in West Africa is second to none. They uh, established Quranic schools, mosques, and Zawiya for the purpose of teaching and worship. And one of the most uh, widely disseminated such uh, order in the modern world is uh, the Tijaniya, which has uh, tens of millions of followers, uh, the overwhelming majority of whom live in Sub-Saharan Africa. But it's not just in numbers that Sub-Saharan African Muslims dominate the Tijaniya, but also in intellectual production. And some of the major doctrinal elaboration of the Tijaniya was the work of West African Tijani. And uh, for the sake of time, I, don't, uh, I will not enter into details on, on their contribution. But, uh, but uh, just uh, clearly, you know, uh, this shows that Sub-Saharan African Islam is far from uh, being a minor thread in the larger Islamic tapestry. Uh, <clears throat> now, the turn of the 20th century witnessed the expansion of European colonial powers and uh, the Islamic states created in West Africa in the 18th and 19th century, they all succumbed to European military might. As Omar al-Naqad notes in his study of the pilgrimage tradition in West Africa, they were Muslims who left for the Holy Lands uh, because they did not want to live in a land governed by infidels. Ahmad Shafi has dominated that, has documented that these African Muslims who settled in Saudi Arabia in the early 10th, 20th century were actively involved in proselytizing and teaching and thus they helped the regime of King Ibn Saud uh, at its beginning in the field of teaching and spreading uh, uh, Salafi Wahhabi Islam, both inside and outside uh, Saudi Arabia. Africans such as Abdurrahman al-Ifriqi from Mali, Sheikh al-Jami from Ethiopia and others were among the most prominent teachers in Medina and this again refused the, uh, refused the dominant narrative that Wahhabism only spread globally from Saudi Arabia to the periphery of the Islamic world, uh, thanks to the uh, Saudi wealth. Now, I want to say a few things about, a uh, few words about the Islamic, uh, the pilgrimage tradition and how it contributed to the spread of literacy in, uh, in West Africa. The pilgrimage tradition has a thousand year history in black Africa, and more than any factor, it was the pilgrimage that integrated the Islamic scholarship of West Africa into the larger Islamic intellectual tapestry in the second millennium. Nowadays, two million Muslims fly to Mecca from all over the world to perform the rituals of pilgrimage in a few days and return home. By contrast, in past centuries, it took many years to reach the Holy Lands, not only because of the difficulties of travel, but also because the purpose of the pilgrimage was not only a means of accomplishing the rituals in the Holy Lands, but also intellectual pursuits. Students stayed for a while in centers of learning along the way and also uh, in the Holy Lands themselves to study and to receive intellectual credentials as scholars and as, uh, as sheikh. And Cairo had become a major center of Islamic learning uh, when the pilgrimage tradition started in West Africa it was a resting point for all pilgrimage routes, and there is evidence that Muslim students from Sub-Saharan Africa have been studying in Cairo since the mid-13th century at least. One such piece of evidence 
is the Madrasa Ibn Rashid, a school established in Cairo in 1258 for the benefits of uh, students from Borno through an endowment given by Borno merchants uh, to the Qadi uh, Alamuddin Ibn Rashid and after whom the school was named. So this is mostly, uh, this, this is most probably the first uh, West African foundation in the Middle East. And it received uh, Borno students until the 18th century. There is another piece of evidence, you know, of uh, West Africans' presence as students in Cairo. It is the Riwaq al-Barnawi, or uh, students, uh, or hotel, student hostels for the students of Borno, of Borno you know, or a residence for these uh, students in Cairo, which was established in 1258 uh, through a donation from the king of Borno. Now, over the course of many centuries, West African pilgrims studied in Egypt with major luminaries, including Jalal al-Din Asuyuti. For example, uh, the works of Jalal al-Din Asuyuti were taught in West Africa during his lifetime, especially his famous tafsir, uh, the, the famous tafsir al-Jalalain, which he co-authored with Jalal al-Din al So as early, you know, uh, during his lifetime, his works were being uh, uh, taught in West Africa because of the students who were, uh, who were go uh, going there to study. So the intellectual contacts that the trade routes uh, generated not only took student scholars to Egypt to study with Egyptian sheikh, it also encouraged Egyptian uh, scholars to uh, and, uh, and other Arab ulama to visit the West and Central Bilad Sudan, where they, where they served as advisors uh, to the black African kings and were generously rewarded. So West African scholars, I must emphasize, were not always junior partners in this intellectual conversation. Some of their teachings had a great impact in North Africa. Ahmed Baba at Timbukti, for example, is uh, you know one of uh, such scholars. Uh, he was arrested and deported to Morocco after the Moroccan invasion, and his 1600 volume library was confiscated in the aftermath of the of the uh, Saudian conquest of Songhai. Ahmed Baba resided in Morocco between May 15, uh, 1594 and February 1608, and he was freed after two years of house arrest, but was required to remain in residence in Marrakesh. And he was invited to teach in the major Marrakesh college, the Congre Congregational Mosque of the Sharif. Uh, and some of his students became very, very influential scholars and helped consolidate his reputation. I will just cite one of them, uh, <coughs> Ahmed bin Muhammad al-Makkari al-Tilimsani, who died in 1632 and who is you know, the author of The Breath of perfume from the branch of Greek Andalusia, one of our most important reference on the intellectual history of Muslim Spain. And Ahmed Baba was also uh, a major, a very prominent uh, a scholar of, uh, of uh, a Maliki scholar. Right. Another scholar with, worth mentioning who made a great, great impact in Egypt is Muhammad al-Kashinawi. He was trained in Kashina in northern Nigeria. He left his country for the Holy Land for the Holy Lands, performed the Hajj, and on his return settled in Cairo, where he lived and taught until his death in 1741. And the work of Dalia Gubara has shown that his work, Kashinas, Kashinawi's work, Durul Mandum, displays, and I quote Dalia Gubara, extensive knowledge of scientific and cosmological theories that have prevailed over the centuries in all of the Islamic, Christian, and Jewish traditions, as well as their precursors in classical uh, antiquity. Now, having um, uh, described uh, this system uh, and how it operated before colonialism, I would like now to conclude uh, with the impact that European colonial rule had on this uh, uh, intellectual tradition. Western methods of learning imported to West Africa after colonialism were influenced by Enlightenment ideas so that ideas of absolute devotion to a master, the search for knowledge as an act of devotion, physical pain and suffering as a central, as central in character building, all those ideas differed markedly from uh, conceptions of human welfare and freedom 
embodied in colonial pedagogy and epistemology. Memorization, which had been the key method of storing information in the classical epistemology, uh, is now decried as the polar opposite of rational uh, reasoning, and above all, the paradigm of you know knowledge transmission which existed you know before was uh, was, was challenged. By the time African countries became independent, Western conceptions of of schooling had become very influential. Indeed, Muslims in West Africa uh, realized that uh, modern education leading to the receipt of a degree also facilitated uh, you know, securing a well-paid job. Many Muslims received education in colonial languages. Among those who opted for Arabic language education, many embraced the organization of schooling uh, uh, into age groups according to a specific time frame and using a, cu a united curriculum, which is largely the European model. Traditional master-disciple relations have been critiqued also, but this practice still, you know, exists uh, because uh, for uh, Muslims, uh, you know, uh, they do not uh, so much have to choose between the old and the new, at least for some of them, but they can embrace uh, both and as each uh, fulfill a function uh, that the other uh, uh, does not. Now I will conclude maybe with the you know main argument of the book. I don't have the time to. This is uh, you know how uh, Africa was colonized you know by uh, European, and you can see the map of colonial Africa and some of the changes that happened you know during uh, uh, colonialism and how the system of knowledge production was uh, completely uh, transformed. But the main argument of the book is that Africa has been represented in academia as well as in popular representation as a continent of warring tribes. And one of the main challenges of nation building, so the story goes, was to create a sense of belonging among different tribes separated by colonial and post-colonial boundaries. And this has been uh, so well documented that it has become, if not the single story, at least the dominant narrative. And what I argue is that large sections of uh, you know, people in West Africa and in uh, Muslim Africa in general have, in the past and the present, proven their ability to, to transcend parochial identities and difference in the common cause. And they have uh, 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 indeed claimed the, their independence of thought and common destiny. And more than anything, this is embodied uh, in a long literary tradition that has been obscured by European colonial hegemonic discourses of the past century, which tend to represent Africa essentially as a continent of orality and obscured the tradition. I have speaking, spoken for 55 minutes, so I, I think I will just stop here and uh, will be happy to answer any questions. Thank you for your attention.